Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming or tuning in or whatever you're doing for our August 2022 meeting. There's one more person comes through the door. Um, my name is Peter, the president of the Space Association. We've got a fairly packed information night tonight. Um, so I'll get straight into it. Um, I'm just going to do a very brief uh, association news uh, first of all. Then we've got uh, Angelo de Grazia uh, piping in in about 10 minutes with his update of what his adventures are about. And then I'm going to do a little bit of space, Australian space news and some international oh, space, Australian and international news, supposed to be. And then we've got um, uh, Mel Jarman tuning in uh, at 7.30 for uh, a presentation on his uh, Jarman Enterprise Space Project that they're working on. And then we have a look at the Artemis program and uh, a look at the Artemis One mission which is due to kick off on Monday evening, Melbourne time. All right, so without any further ado, um, the association, we're a non-profit, non-political group, the Space Association, we have our meetings, which one of which is tonight, monthly meetings. And then we also run a weekly radio show with uh, Andrew Rennie as the DJ with the mostest. And that is also um, uh, edited and put up as a podcast uh, on our uh, podcast channel. And you can find that at our space.asn.au website. Uh, we did run a uh, member survey and we got a bit of detail back on that. Um, we, last month, we indicated we were going to put out a request for a proposal, which we've done. However, I don't think we've got any submissions at this point, but I've been talking with some people and there might be something coming through. So watch your space. If you're still, the thing is still open. So if you've got any ideas or plans go back and have a look at that email and jump on that uh, website and put your ideas in uh, request for a proposal email was a, there was a link in there to that i mean that wasn't the email but there was a link for the serve to the request for proposal well, this went out uh, like the day after last month's meeting. I'll go back and have a look. Oh. I don't recall. Okay. And was there an email going tonight? Yep. Yep. Oh, maybe it's in the spam folder or something. Maybe you check your spam folder or something, perhaps. We had we had some one problem where the credit card. I had this issue myself. Oh, someone trying to get in. I think is it. Someone was zooming by. Oh, hey, just come in the other end. We'll let you in, sorry. Just pull it. Just leave it ajar like that if you can. G'day. Hello. Hey, welcome. Thanks for coming. It's on the side there, you're good. Oh, we just block that out because a bit of noise in the rest of the thing. Welcome, thanks for coming tonight. Um, yeah, so we're just talking about uh, some of the events that we've been doing. Um, an event coming up in uh, December is our Apollo 17 50th anniversary uh, event. And um, that'll be at the Sun Theatre in Yarraville on the 10th of December. Um, haven't got finalised plans of that yet, but it'll be an afternoon event and um, we'll send you more information about that. Uh, and we're gonna possibly have a rocket launch happen as well. Maybe a few, Angelo's got a few rockets he's getting out of his garage. So we'll see what happens. Uh, the Arable, uh, the Sun Theatre in the Arable is just over the other side of the Westgate Bridge and you turn right, it's pretty easy access from uh, anywhere. There's a train station there as well. Once again, we are a member-based group, a non-profit group. Uh, so if you're a member, thank you very much. If you're not a member, maybe consider joining. And if you were a member and you're no longer, maybe come back and uh, join us up again. It just helps to fund what we do with the station and the meetings and the other activities we do and our outreach activities. So once again, we're meeting here tonight at the Sun uh, the Golden Gate Cinema, uh, Golden Gate Hotel in South Melbourne. Um, just had a great meal downstairs. So our formula for the meetings are fourth Monday of the month. So the next one will be the 26th of September. Uh, and then as follows the bouncing ball, December meeting is on the, I think it's the second week, second Monday of the month because December's a bit crazy. Okay, and 
we've got uh, a guest from the Melbourne Space Program presenting um, on their ACRAX2 project uh, next month. So that'll be fascinating. Melbourne Space Program um, launched, uh, successfully launched and had operating ACRAX1 that went into orbit. And um, so they're working on a bigger, better um, satellite with more capability, ACRUX2. So uh, this will be fascinating to see and to, and to hear about. All right, a little bit, as it says, a little bit of Australian space news. Um, so a SpaceX team is heading to Australia to investigate the Dragon space junk crash, as you might have recalled, um, a piece of the, what they determined to be the Crew 1 Dragon spacecraft, in fact, the trunk section. Um, crashed into uh, into uh, New South Wales. Uh, the trunk section is an unpressurized area, and it basically dis disconnects just prior to the re-entry of the Dragon capsule and burns up. Theoretically, it's got solar panels on it and that type of thing. So this bit didn't. In fact, a friend of mine is a pilot. Um, actually, saw the thing going through the sky uh, on the day. And thanks to our friend Andrew Rennie over here, we tracked back the time, date, and location. And it worked out that was this piece of space junk. So uh, when I told him, he was very excited and quite... Uh, so he actually videoed that from his flight deck. And uh, Andrew said, oh, actually, they actually look out of the window, those guys, do they? Occasionally. So, yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, so that... Um, uh, so it separated... The vehicle took off... Uh, sorry, in the atmosphere in the 2nd of May in 21, but continued to orbit until um, um, it, it re entered in July the 8th. So, uh, yeah, so it was determined to be a, a piece of that uh, trunk arrowed there. Just, uh, there's somebody else trying to get in. Hang on, just push. Tim. So yeah, they'll be heading down to Australia to uh, to have a look at that. So I'm not sure where those pieces are going to end up, uh, whether they're going to go back to the States or whether they're going to become the property of the owner of the uh, the farm or whether it's national security. I've got no idea. Anyway, uh, maybe SpaceX will take it back home. Um, that's my Australian space news, by the way. Sorry, there's more happening in Australia, but I didn't have time to put it together. Global space news. Uh, the Perseverance rover photographs its own landing debris. So the Ingenuity helicopter has been doing several flights and on April uh, the 19th, it flew over the crash site of the uh, Perseverance back shell and took a photograph. I would think it's pretty cool. Um, uh, on April the 19th, it took that picture. Um, in Japan, the, uh, oh, sorry, Japan, the Chinese uh, space program, they've, uh, as you know, I think we mentioned last month, they just are about to launch their next module onto their space station. They've done that and they've now deployed um, uh, a huge solar wings similar to what they've put up on the space station. Um, so um, that was been down to ground. I don't think they've been to live, but it was been down. So um, it was a 30 meters long and a total wingspan of 55 meters and 110 square meters of uh, collecting area. So uh, plan they also plan to launch a third and final module to the Tengong in October called a Meng Tian. That experimental module will also carry a pair of large solar wings. So uh, that's the rendering of what the final space station is, about, the Tengong space station is supposed to look like. So they're making some pretty significant uh, progress, the it's Chinese. It's very easy to see here in Melbourne as well. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay, it goes over quite regularly, does it? Yeah. Okay. So they're spying on us as well. All right, um, the Russian did a spacewalk the other day and it was cut short by a space, space suit power problem. Um, uh, the August 17 spacewalk uh, continued outfitting the European Space Agency's robotic arm. Um, however, telemetry from Artemyev's spacesuit showed a problem in its power system. So basically they said, you guys better get back in here. Um, so before that voltage fluctuation, the cosmonauts completed the installation of two cameras on the elbow of the European robotic arm. Uh, so they've stuff that haven't completed is including relocation of the arm's external control panel and testing of a rigidized mechanism on the arm. So the exertion marked a 250 second spacewalk uh, used European and American uh, um, 
American and Russian uh, spacewalk. So it's been, a, I remember they described it back early on as a wall of spacewalks because there's been a lot. So it's a fourth spacewalk uh, primarily dedicated to the European robotic arm operations. Um, so they currently got seven astronauts uh, on the space station, US, Russian, and Italian. Um, now this Russian spacewalk occurred as US space suits on the International Space Station remain unavailable for all but emergency spacewalks. NASA's investigating cause of a water leak noticed during a March spacewalk. So the spacewalk situation on the ISS is getting a little bit, um, a little bit tricky. So weather permitting, the SpaceX Cargo Dragon spacecraft is set to depart the station this week and splash down a returning the leaky suit to the US suit yeah, back to Earth to um, just to, for investigation. So we'll see how that goes. All right, quick Artemis update. I've got a later report on Artemis, but this is just a, a latest. So the SLS arrives back at uh, pad 35 for launch. And um, so the multi-hour roll, roll process uh, ended in a sunrise arrival at the pad. So they will be working, content, connecting and testing all of the uh, connections and um, electrical connections and physical, mechanical and other connections on that. Um, so it's the first time since May 31, 2011 that a vehicle has emerged from the VAB at Kennedy Space Center for launch operations. Every other time anything's rolled out, including Artemis has been for testing. So this is the first time it's Something's going out to get launched. Complex 35 was used for Apollo, Skylab, Apollo Soyuz and Space Shuttle, and also the old Ares 1X mission. And it's been slowly modified. Um, in the final, as people might recall, in the Space Shuttle era, they had a, um, a fixed service structure. That's all been gone. So now it's back into a clean pad, similar to what they had back in the Apollo era, where you basically had a, a clean pad and the, and the crawler brought everything up onto the pad for the launch, including the, uh, the launch tower. Unlike Apollo, however, they don't have a mobile service structure um, to be able to access the rocket in, in more tricky situations. So that means it had to do some serious work on the SLS had to roll back to the VAB. Um, the Artemis one is scheduled to spend 13 days at the pad and uh, after it's August 16 rollout, uh, it'll be hooked up with all the plumbing and should all go well, the stage will be set for the 60th overall launch and the second flight to the moon after Apollo 10, which took place back in 1969. So once again, it's um, currently scheduled to, to uh, call the stations at 11.53 p.m. Australian time, August 27. Fueling will begin in August 29 and the launch window opens at 10.33 Australian Eastern Standard Time. I've got both things there, so I should have got rid of the EDT. Yeah, Australian Eastern Standard at Melbourne time at 10.33 p.m. on Monday night. And it finishes at uh, 33 minutes past midnight. Uh, so they have 25 minutes, uh, 25 minutes, 25 days to launch after the flight termination system testing uh, on the launch vehicle is completed on August 12th. So if they can't um, launch 29th, they have other windows in the 2nd and the 5th of September. However, if they're not able to make any of those, the caller transport would return to the pad uh, with the flight termination system. If we talked about the fact that it doesn't have as good access as the old Apollo, this is part of the issue. So they have to go back to the VAB and, um, and then they'll have an October 17 to 31 window. I think I'm missing a bit, okay. Yeah, so uh, as it stands, it's uh, targeted at three days at the end of August, so we're starting the 29th. Um, so the first window is once again, Monday night to our launch window. Um, and that will be a landing 42 days later on October 12th. If that doesn't get done, August, uh, September 3 to our window starting at 2.48 a.m. Australian time, 39 days, 39 days later landing on October 10. September 6 would be the next one, one and a half hour window opening at 7.12 a.m. Uh, and ending the mission at October 17. And the azimuth for these flights will be um, 62 degrees with resulting with a 38 degree inclination of the orbit. 
So this is a bit of a graphic that NASA has been updating. So you can see the various functions and tests that they've gone through. So now they're down to one and uh, test and install the power, uh, pyrotechnics for the flight termination system. So that's done. Now, the system has two solid rocket boosters, similar to the, S, to the SRBs on the uh, shuttle. However, they've got an extra segment. Once again, similar to the shuttle, they're using shuttle engines. So these are the engines that are bolted onto the bottom of the SLS as we speak. So they've had eight, one, one of them's had four flights, one's had 12, one's had three, one's had six. Um, and they're gonna end up at the bottom of the ocean if this thing goes off, a bit sad, but anyway, because these are reusable engines. Anyway. Why isn't my thing advancing? Okay, so this is the uh, the windows that uh, NASA published a little while ago. The blue highlighted ones are the current, like the next availables. Um, and the other ones, the greens are where they can achieve all their um, expected um, targets or all expected results. The light green are the ones where they can, but it, it's a longer mission and, it's, and the red ones are where they can't do it. And the gray ones are not available at all. So what's going on with my, oh, here we go. All right, so um, there's a lot of information in this and I've tried to pare it down as much as possible, but yeah, we'll see how we go. So this is a history of the space launch system uh, and the Artemis One mission preview, which I've subtitled the tortured history of the SLS. <laughs> so here we go. So you may ask yourself, how did we get here? I'm gonna try and answer that. Oh, by the way, it's talking heads. Um, okay, so it's been a long road here. So in the early 2000s, NASA was already envisaging broad strokes of what they might do after the space shuttle program. Um, so the America's uh, space shuttle program was simply too expensive to maintain and accounted for too much of NASA's budget. Plus that also killed 14 astronauts, so that didn't help either. So the Columbia disaster finally brought the topic to a head and accelerated the retirement of the space shuttle. Uh, these decisions culminated in the NASA space plan, the vision for space exploration, which became a cornerstone of the NASA space policy under George W. So part of that was uh, planning of a deep space exploration vehicle um, and return to the moon in 2020. <laughs> Eventually this semi-permanent moon base will be established and serve as a staging ground for deep space exploration. So NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe at the time officially unveiled the human spaceflight program to develop a new class of vehicles and carry humankind back to the moon, Mars and beyond, which is called the Constellation Program. Um, Apollo, uh, Constellation was called Apollo on steroids and had a grand ambitions uh, to take them back to the glory days when uh, America was the first nation to land people on the moon. Uh, so to achieve this, they had proposed developing two vehicles, the Ares 1 and the Ares 5, and also the Orion capsule. Um, the Orion capsule was to launch into outer space on top of a skinny Atlas uh, Ares 1 with the Ares 5 would serve as the cargo. So the idea would be they'd have the people on the stick, the Ares 1, and then have the Ares 5 launch the, the landing vehicle and all the things to get them to deep space and over to the moon and uh, off they go. That was the plan anyway. However, um, they were trying to achieve these uh, ambitious goals with half the funding that they actually would, uh, had during the space race. So the Constellation program eventually uh, became untenable, led to additional delays and led to more budget overruns, which led to more delays. And um, it was chronically underfunded, basically. Uh, President Obama's election in 2008 and um, shift away from the original supporters and creators of the program, the Constellation program was dying in its dying breaths in 2010. <clears throat> Once again, the death, death knell came for the Constellation program uh, in the NASA's fiscal year 2011 budget where the projected five-year budget expense for the Constellation program showed all zeros. So Obama's administration wanted to pivot NASA towards a research and development of in and innovations in new technologies. And um, so their policy envisaged collaborative effort between public and private sectors. 
Uh, they would create, NASA would create and invent the foundation technologies that would enable space, private space companies to develop the next generation of spacecraft. And through this synergy, the US government would jumpstart the private sector and sustain, to, and sustain entrepreneurial spirit and success. So you can see the picture there of Obama with uh, Elon Musk walking around. <clears throat> Uh, because the Obama administration cancelled the Constellation program without seeking congressional support or guidance from the aerospace industry, it, was, it led to a public revolt. Well, I'm not sure about public or maybe the uh, big, big spaces uh, revolt. After all, the Constellation pro program employed many federal workers in several states across southern USA, and the program's demise meant many jobs losses across the board. <clears throat> so due to this predominant uh, uh, prominent backslash Obama administration eventually semi relented and personally traveled to the Kennedy Space Center. And Andrew Rennie was here, was there, and was in the room when he announced the creation of a new heavy. Was that right, Andrew? Yeah. You were there, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, a new heavy rocket that would take the Orion capsule. So the Orion survived to begin the first ever crewed missions beyond the moon into deep space by 2025. In the same speech, he announced goals sending astronauts to an asteroid, the first time in history, manned orbits around Mars by mid thirties and manned Mars landing thereafter. So that eventually evolved, involved, evolved into the NASA Authorization Act of 2010, which directed NASA to develop a heavy lift launch system that can carry payloads beyond low earth orbits, orbit as soon as practical. The act also included detailed specifications such as launch of such a launch system and recommended NASA to reuse technology contracts and workforce under existing vehicle development and associated contracts wherever possible. So try and keep the same workforce, the same people involved, the same gear, the same factories, etc. So these directives made it impossible for NASA to design anything other than the Constellations Ares 5 launch system. And thus the act essentially revived the Constellation program but under a different name called the SLS. Um, and just like that, SLS program was born. October 2015, the first of, th of three planned configurations of the SLS successfully completed NASA's critical design review. Uh, and this was a major milestone for the SLS, becoming the first human rated space delivery system to pass a test in almost 40 years. Shortly thereafter, in December, uh, they passed the critical design views the ground facilities. While SLS was still far from launching, uh, these major milestones demonstrate the program was making incremental steps. However, one of the majority of unofficial nicknames for the SLS is the Senate launch system. Politics aside, one of the main reasons for its nickname is due to the detailed specifications that Congress laid out in its Authorization Act. So this con Congress really got specific on what they told NASA to do with the money that were going to be allocated. So it had to have initial capability, uh, core elements without an upper stage, lifting payloads between 70 and 100 tonnes, capability to carry integrated upper earth departure stage, bring total lift capacity to 130 tonnes or more, capability to lift a multi-purpose crew vehicle, the capability to serve backup system for supplying and supporting the ISS, ISS cargo requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a bit of a graphic I spot found online, the uh, Artemis revenge of the Senate. Very unusual that the Senate would be so specific. So when they created the uh, SLS in 2011 um, to fly the rocket before 2016, uh, well, now launch no earlier than hopefully next Monday, more than six years behind schedule. The Orion spacecraft is arguably worse. The spacecraft was intended to fly humans into deep space, and it's unlikely to do so before at least 2024 with the Artemis II mission. Uh, so that means NASA will have spent two decades developing a vehicle that essentially is a larger, modernized version of an Apollo capsule. You can see the comparisons there. And why has all this happened? Because this is the way Congress wants it. Both Obama and Trump administrations made attempts to at least scale back the funding for SLS. Congress never budged. So NASA has built and launched four rockets in history, Saturn 1, Saturn, 1, Saturn 5, and the Space Shuttle and the Ares 1. 
Saturn V carried us to the moon. The space shuttle helped establish humanity's future in low Earth orbit and the assembly of this ISS. Ares 1 flew just once on a test mission, which was a partial failure. Ares 1, people may not recall, was basically called the stick. It was a solid, one of the shuttle solid rocket boosters with an upper stage, with a kick stage on and the capsule. It was pretty basic. Um, the vibrations apparently was pretty enormous in that thing. Uh, so they're saying that the SS is probably the last rocket that NASA will develop in-house. In some ways, it's a combination of all that has come before it. The SLS rocket and spacecraft rolled the launch pad on a crawler. It was built in the 60s. Uh, the SLS uses space shuttle main engines, as we mentioned before, and solid rocket boosters are derived from the space shuttle. But it doesn't seem to have saved a whole lot of money, but anyway. Um, similar to many NASA projects, SLS has had its share of delays and cost overruns. And it was originally estimated to cost uh, $7 billion. $7 billion dollars with a projected maiden launch date in 2017. And now the SLS maiden voyage, the Exploration One mission, which is hopefully happening on Monday, um, is estimated has exhausted its original seven billion budget by 2015. So, um, so it's already over budget. Estimated that another 10.6 billion uh, is funding is needed until 2022, which is which is kind of now. So some of this date data is a little out of date. I apologise for that. Um, but anyway, the SLS would cost at least three times as much as the original proposed budget. But that sounds familiar, doesn't it? A government project. Anyway, many a rocket industry have criticised these delays and cost overruns. And more recently, the members of Congress are starting to express their concerns with the project as well. With, with the Falcon Heavy's uh, successful demonstration flight a while ago, changing paradigm has started to take hold. After all, the heavy Falcon Heavy's only needs about 500 million to accomplish its maiden flight. Uh, many money whether or not commercial entities are better suited. President Trump added fuel to the fire. Sorry to mention that name, everyone. It gives you a bit of a cold chill when I say that, sorry. Uh, but uh, he added fuel to the discussion by implying that the Falcon Heavy would have cost a lot more if it were developed by NASA. He's probably right about that. One thing he might have been right about. Even with the cost overruns and launch delays, the program, SLS program, is unlikely to be cancelled outright due to its status as a job creator. And there are a couple of reasons that first budget overruns are common in many NASA projects. ISS was well over budget, at least $4 billion. And each launch of the shuttle cost $390 million more than its original projected $54 million per flight. That's adjusted numbers. And second, the SLS program is a massive job creator. The, the program employs over 10,000 people spread across all 50 states of the union. And, um, Therefore, it would be politically un infeasible, unfeasible, infeasible for the Congress to cancel such a program without some significant pushback. So, once again, it's got its own inertia. Yep. So, they're likely to keep it going. This graphic here shows, it's not a very detailed map, of course, but it just shows you how the, 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 the contracts and the contractors and the employees of those contractors are spread across the entire country. So they did reveal in March of this year the uh, the costs of the SLS. Um, uh, so it depends much more um, on the success of the Artemis One. In order for the SLS program to be competitive, the rocket must be able to achieve a per launch cost at a similar price that commercial operators are charging for their rocket launches. I don't think it's going to get anywhere near that. Well, it's been hard to gauge how financially competitive the SLS is. Um, NASA's finally shed some light. So they're talking it's going to be about $4.1 billion per launch. So there's flames you see coming out of the back of it. There's actually money yeah. being burnt. Um, uh, which money actually up? And probably. The figure includes $2.2 billion for the SLS rocket, $1 billion for the capsule, $568 million for the ground-based infrastructure and equipment, and $300 million for the capsule's service module, which comes from the European, yeah. However, the figure does not, not amortise the SLS development costs uh, and is far greater than $2 billion per launch goal that NASA had originally set. So the commercial industry, uh, they're working super heavy vehicles themselves. Both the S uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin have developed their own versions. Um, Starship is capable, well, 
theoretically capable of launching 150 metric tons into low Earth orbit. And Blue Origin's new Glenn is designed to handle 45 metric tons. Both Starship and New Glenn are expected to make their maiden voyages shortly after the current project projected SLS test voyage. So as uh, Angelo indicated, there might be some smoke and fire in, um, in Boca Chica soon with the SLS, uh, with the Starship, I'm not sure. New Glenn, who the heck knows what's going on with Blue, Blue uh, New Glenn and um, Jeff Bezos, he's very secretive. They've shown pictures, I think people might have seen a while ago online, pictures um, of a lot of equipment, a lot of boots, a lot of hardware being built inside this big factory down in Florida, but there's no talk about when it's actually going to fire launch. Um, however, the development of these commercial rockets might not be a zero-sum game for NASA. Any success here might provide the much-needed jolt to the SLS program and, um, and hopefully kick them along to be more competitive. In reality, no one should be expect Congress to care really about the high cost of the SLS near I program. The legislature has created the programs, have always created the programs this way. Uh, key members of Congress have been critical of NASA every time the agency has tried to break free of cost plus contracting and use more commercial approach through the fixed price through fixed price contracts. Congressional skepticism has persisted, even as a commercial approach has borne fruit. Tensions with Russia, for example, um, NASA is the only uh, NASA only has independent access to the space to space because of the Crew Dragon spacecraft now. Because, um, well, the Soyuz still is capable of doing it, but uh, if they were suddenly stopped from doing that, um, Crew Dragon at this point would be the only one because the uh, Boeing um, Starliner is still not flight proven at this stage. It got there, but it's not man rated yet. They haven't got a, man, a crewed flight. And they're still not quite transparent about how successful it was. So, yes, yeah, so I think it's going to work, but we, we don't know. At this point, as we talk today, there's only one way of getting there other than uh, Soyuz. Um, the House Science Committee uh, Chair Eddie Bernice Johnson took aim at NASA's commercial space efforts in her opening statements at a hearing. I find the sum of these actions to be very troubling. This is talking about uh, supporting and encouraging the private sector. It raises questions of whether NASA will even retain the capabilities and workforce within the agency that will be needed to get the US astronauts to Mars if all these privatization plans are realized. So um, anyway, 2020 realm was a banner year, the commercial space sector. They had the Blue Origins New Shepard Virgin Galactic had their crew test flight and Inspiration4 on a SpaceX uh, Dragon capsule with a first fully commercial crew um, was, um, was, was launched. They've got another one coming up with a spacewalk soon. Uh, the Europa Clipper has been decoupled. Uh, the Europa Clipper was going to be the first sort of um, heavy duty or heavy payload with scientific um, requirements quite a scientific uh, target to be launched on the SLS. However, with all the delays and cost of runs, they've pushed it onto a SpaceX uh, a Falcon Heavy. It's ended years of uncertainty. And, um, and uh, I mean, Congress originally mandated that the thing go on the SLS, but they managed to finally uh, relent in 22 and allowed it to consider using uh, the alternative. So now it's going to be on a Falcon Heavy, and um, uh, yeah, so the, the actual Europa clip is $4.25 billion, and uh, the $178 million transport contract on the Falcon Heavy. So, rather than SLS direct to Jupiter directory, however, the Falcon Heavy is instead expected to rely on orbital mechanics of Mars and Earth to successfully deliver the final destination. Now, it's going to be a bit longer and take longer with Earth flybys and all that kind of nonsense. Anyway, they're going to get there. So Artemis 1, once again, it's going to fly theoretically on Monday. It's got secondary payloads. It's got quite a number of uh, CubeSats, and uh, I'm not going to read everything here, but this is a list of all the different CubeSats uh, which have been installed into an interstage section just below the actual um, 
uh, Orion capsule and they will be deployed. Um, so they've got lunar science missions, technology demonstrator and radiation uh, uh, um, experiments involved in there. Um, so the actual construction uh, of the longer term um, Artemis program is underway. The uh, SLS is getting ready, while well, it's getting ready for its maiden flight north of Grumman, has awarded a $3.19 billion contract to producing SLS boosters for the Artemis 4 to 8 missions. Um, and the booster production and operations contract uh, uh, also includes funding and will develop and produce a new version of the booster for Artemis 9. So I don't know how that works. Uh, the new design is expected to reduce the weight by the, of the boosters by using lighter composite materials and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, secondary goal, Northrop Grumman is also looking at eventually reduce the cost of these boosters by 25 to 50%. Yeah, okay, right, we'll see. Uh, so the core stage, all three of the current planned SLS configurations will have the same core stage design. The core stage contains cryogenic and liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen that serves as fuel for the RS-25 engines attached to it. We mentioned those before. So these are the three, three configurations. Um, so it's manufactured at the NASA uh, Mishu assembly facility in uh, New Orleans with, by Boeing. And the four RS-25 liquid propeller engines are attached at the bottom. Uh, so they're the same engines that powered the space shell, as we mentioned before. Uh, uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne had built 16 of those RS-25 engines um, left over from the shuttle um, era. These are three versions of the vehicle, the Block 1, the Block 1B for cargo, and then the Block 2 cargo. Uh, solar rock boosters, Block 1, Block 1B of the SLS will be powered by two five-segment solar rocket boosters. Uh, I'm not going to go through the numbers, how big they are, they are pretty big. Uh, based on the shuttle ones, they're going to have approximately 25% more total impulse than the shuttle. Uh, unlike the space shuttle, they're designed for single zone, they're going to dump into the ocean and sink. Um, block 2, NASA is, largely, uh, is still largely in research and development phase, and we'll be developing advanced boosters that will enable SLS to achieve maximum launch mandates. Uh, the uh, block one, the initial configuration of the SLS will contain a core stage of the four uh, RS-25 engines, along with two five-segment SRBs, we mentioned that. Uh, we'll use the cryogenic propulsion stage, or ICPS, uh, as the upper stage. That's it there. That will boost the Orion capsule over to the moon. Um, the, it's a, it's a, basically a modification of the Delta cryogenic second stage, by ULA um, and the Orion crew vehicle will be completed by sitting on top of that ICPS. Both the Block 1B crew and the cargo version will have similar configurations as Block 1, but instead it will be using the I instead of using the ICPS upper stage, we'll be using a newly designed exploration upper stage. I'm not sure where that's at in the development. Uh, cargo fitting, there we go. So the Block 1B is expected to to be 364, so I didn't give time to convert these, 364 feet tall, whereas Block 1B will be expected 327 and lifting 105 metric tons. So it was the Block 1B cargo was to, was to launch the Europa Clipper, but as we heard before, it ain't doing that anymore. So the crew, uh, Block 1B crew will be inaugurated by the Exploration Mission 2. Block two will contain the core stage and four RS-25 engines. Five second boosters will be replaced by the to be developed advanced boosters. Uh, all that, you can read if you want. Uh, block two cargo configuration is expected to stand 365 feet. The block two crew version would make its debut on the exploration mission nine and the cargo version exploration mission 10. So. Who knows when they're going to be. So once again, the mission on Monday, uncrewed test flight from 39B is going to launch hopefully on Monday night, our time. Launch window, once again, 10.33 p.m. to 0.33 on Tuesday. 
42 days, three hours and 20 minute permission duration, et cetera, et cetera. So target is flashed down in the Pacific. Uh, yeah, I won't read all that. Um, so this is freely available on the NASA website, but this is kind of the mission profile of what it's going to do. It's going to go into this interesting uh, retrograde orbit around the moon. So it's not going to be quite an Apollo 8 orbit. It's going to be a sort of a looping kind of in and out type of orbit. I think it requires less energy to get into and less energy to get out of than your standard Apollo 8 60 mile circular orbit. So the first mission will demonstrate the performance of both the Orion and SLS. Uh, I hope that will pave the way for future missions. And as we heard before, ESA, the Space Association's very own Angelo de Grazzi is going to be there. So this is him standing in front of the, well, he probably won't be quite that close. And he's, he's looking the wrong way, anyway. So Angelo is obviously, as you can see, very excited. Okay, so this is, I'm not gonna read all this, but this is kind of the, the mission preview um, and timelines of the events of what's going to happen. Uh, obviously the launch is the big exciting thing if, once it gets started. Uh, two minutes and 12 seconds, the boosters separate. Three minutes and 13 seconds, the service module panels jettison. Three minutes and 19 seconds, the launch abort tower jettisons. Eight minutes, 16 seconds, the main engine cut off and core stage separation. Se then we have the 18 minutes and 20 seconds solar panel deployment. Um, Perigree, per Perigee, Raise maneuver. Trans Earth injection is one hour and 38 minutes and th three seconds uh, after launch. So we'll know pretty well what's happening on the night if you actually want to stay up late enough for it. I probably will be, I suppose. I think I'm mostly supposed to work the next morning, but anyway. Um, so, yeah, that should be interesting. So, read all that if you wish. Um, this presentation will be on our YouTube channel. You can go back and have a look at it uh, for future reference if you wish. Um, just as a bit of an overall, I dug up this uh, Moon to Mars manifest from NASA. Uh, it's a relatively recent one, but it gives you a bit of an idea of the timing of um, when these things might take place. So Artemis 1, obviously 2022. Artemis 2, the first crewed mission, they're aiming for 2024. Artemis 3, um, moon landing on the tw in 2025. 2026 looks like a year to go on a holiday. And then 27, 2027 is Artemis 4. Um, and that's hopefully going to launch to the gateway. So, uh, and onwards into 20, 2033. So I'll just go to the next slide, which because it zooms in a little bit on the next, well, next three years. So uh, Artemis 1, CubeSats, it's interesting got the lunar communications network upgrade so the ongoing process through to 2024 um and what else we got here yeah anyway uh, i can't actually locate where the oh they've got 2025 spacex crewed lunar demo our uh, 2024 spacex uncrewed lunar demo so interesting anyway we'll see all that pans out obviously keep in touch with the space association we'll keep you up to date with what's happening um and uh monday night hopefully it'll get off the pad it'll be great and hopefully andrew will be there um and that's kind of it from me i apologize for any or all of the inaccuracies there's probably hundreds of them um and that's it for me what time we got um and i think we've got a little presentation of andrew rennie if i'm not mistaken so uh, thanks everyone Sophia Airborne Observatory, which is not to be confused with a Kuiper. This is a converted Boeing 747, and it is being retired. So a few days ago, it made its last visit to Christchurch, which it used to frequently leave from. And this is a thing from Television New Zealand. Ready for takeoff and a final goodbye. I came especially to see her. We flew down from Nelson because he is an absolute plane nut. It's a historical moment. It won't be here again. This is 
My first time seeing it. Bound for home base in California, Sophia, short for Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, is a modified Boeing 747. The plane carries a reflecting telescope, allowing astronomers to study the solar system beyond what we can see from the ground. It's a brilliant piece of engineering. New Zealand providing the perfect backdrop. During your winter, uh, when we have the cold, crisp air that uh, allows for the telescope to have a nice nice clean look out into other galaxies. There have been several discoveries by Sophia, from detecting the first molecule after the Big Bang to looking into the centre of the Milky Way. This is the last time Sophia will be here in Christchurch, with NASA winding up the mission at the end of next month after eight years. It's always been you know, very special you know, coming here to Christchurch and seeing the evolution and uh, you know, the tenacity of the city. With newer technology superseding the ageing aircraft, it's a bittersweet end. Once we've uh, cleared the airspace of uh, New Zealand and really started to head north over the sea, that's when it's probably going to get kind of quiet in the aircraft when everybody realizes what's going on. Tilting farewell and a final salute to Aotearoa. Katie Stevenson, One News. All right, um, that's actually it for the formal content of tonight's meeting. Um, next month, we have um, somebody from the Melbourne Space program coming along talking about I think I mentioned before about their overall projects and particularly about the Aquax 2 uh, CubeSat project they're working on so that will be quite quite fascinating um, if you're not already registered with us um, there's a QR code in the room here or drop us an email via our website space.asn.au and uh, we'll put you on our our email list and let you know what we're doing as far as an association sometimes we get guest speakers in the last few days and we are able to add them in if it fits so there's always something going on at the, these meetings um far than that as far as that thanks ashley for all the it back setup uh, and michael for setting up uh, the schedule of the speakers and the people and the content and um, is malcolm still there if anyone has any questions for malcolm just go ahead and unmute your microphone and uh, malcolm can take a stab at it and that's it for me We'll leave it open for about 10 minutes and if nothing else happens, we'll turn it all off.